Welcome to Gibson's Bookstore Remote. I am Elizabeth, the events coordinator from Gibson's Bookstore in Concord, New Hampshire, and I am joined this evening by three fantasy authors, which I am delighted to introduce tonight. We have Andrea Harrison, whose book Master of Poisons comes out next week, so this is a bit of a pre-event. We also have Jen Lyons, who has the third in her trilogy, The Memory of Souls, which is larger than I am. <laughs> And then we have Ryan Van Loan with The Sin in the Steel. Good evening, all of you. Welcome. How are you tonight? Great. Good, good, great. Um, yeah. just, just real quick, though, not a trilogy. That's true. So, no. <laughs> um, five, right? One, two, three, that, I'm five. sorry. So that's, that's a, you said there was five, right? Yeah, there's five. So that's a yeah. quintet. Right. We are looking forward to it. Yes. Well, all right. You are correct. There are five in that, and this is the third, so we're right in the middle. Uh, so I will, I will start with you, and I'll ask each of you, tell me a little bit about your book and how the series or the book came to be. Jen, I'll start with you. Oh, okay. Um, so uh, basically, you know, it's a, it's a five-book series, and it's kind of about... <laughs> It's, a, it's about the chosen one, um, but uh, it's it's me asking, you know, what if being the chosen one was actually just really terrible? Um, what if what if uh, what if the chosen one is is not actually going to save everybody? So um, because you know it, we see this now, right? We we look to these these individual people to save society, and and maybe maybe that's that's not all it's cracked up to be um and then um you know so the the third book uh memory of souls is pretty much just far enough in so that everything is really really going downhill um, <laughs> it's just everything is really really problematic at this point um and then of course the the series as a whole was a, it was a wonderful opportunity to uh you know have really big dragons which was important to me. <laughs> so where did it come from? Where did, how did it start? How did it, how did it, what was the seed? Well, you know, I mean, there's uh, a book, a series this big, um, you know, a world this big was a long, long time in development. Um, it started out kind of in tabletop RPG land. Um, but then when I decided to sit down and write a fantasy no uh, novel that became a series, I, I kind of went with the world building I had already started. So, you know, it was what I had. Um, and then, um, and then it just kind of, I pulled together all of the things that I loved from fantasy books, but also all of the things that I hated from fantasy books, all the things I really wanted to see done differently. Mm. So. Now, when you say things that you hated, you mean things that, you would have done differently. So the chosen one, therefore, it's not you know, all the, the raids. It's lots of stabbing and the chosen one is done differently. Um, the roles that a lot of um, that women have in a lot of fantasy books, I wanted to see done differently. Um, you know, there's just a lot of um, you know uh, the idea that um, that that royalty is kind of automatically good. That you see in a lot of fantasy, um, I I didn't want that. <laughs> so um, a, a lot of that sort of stuff was things things that I wanted to play with. Andrea, tell me a little bit about Master of Poisons and how that came to be. Okay, so Master of Poisons. Um, uh, well, there's a there's a, a poison wind blowing across an empire, um, and a lot of people want to deny that there's this poison desert, you know, encroaching on their everything, on their lives. It will like take the, you know, the plants, the birds, the bees, the fish, everything. Um, so, but they just want to ignore it because it's, you know, down the road or over there or across the, the ocean. Um, uh, but there's a, the main character, Jola, uh, has been warning people for years, like, look, we got to do something. And, it, and it's not just, quote, nature, it's what we're doing but they haven't been listening. And then finally things get really bad. Um, so Jola is like, oh my gosh, you know, 
it's getting really bad and people start to think, ah, there's nothing to be done. So they just want to keep doing what they've been doing. So, you know, instead of really pulling together and changing, they get stuck in what they're doing. So Joel is, you know, trying to figure out how to, you know, help people see and change. Um, and then there's Awa, who's a young woman at the beginning of the book, and she is, uh, wants to be a griot, a storyteller, and she can um, go to this place called Smokeland, where she experiences the world in a different way and can have insight and do all these amazing things. And she's a friend to bees and horses and trees and rivers and stuff. So she's like trying to sort of really get to know herself, harness her powers and be in the world. And she has no interest in fixing anything. She would just like to, you know, be how old she is and experience all these things. But the two of them are tested, you know, as they um, really try to figure out how to conjure the world they want. Um, and, you know, and she does love the world, but why should she have to fix it? Can't she just, you know, be in it? Um, so, um, uh, and this book came about because I was trying to write a novella, right? So someone at Tor.com said, can you write a novella? And I said, I'm not really good at short. Um, you know, I, but maybe a novella could work because I really have a hard time with short stories, but 40,000 words, maybe it did. Yeah, sure, I'll try that. Didn't work. <laughs> so as I was writing it, I went, okay, this is not enough to tell the story. And also something that Jen said, I, you know, I'm not telling a typical fantasy, so I can't rely on the master narrative where people understand the tropes in my book. I have to like illuminate them. Um, so I was like, okay, right. And I didn't even know what I was doing, so I needed to explain it to myself. So between all of those things, it turned into a few more pages than a novella, but Tor bought it anyhow. So I feel like it all had a happy ending. So. Um, and then Ryan, yours, The Sin in the Steel. Tell me a bit about this and what was the seed that began this book? Sure. Yeah, The, the Sin in the Steel is really the story of Sam Bukina Bakalhara. She is a uh, autodidact street rat. Um, and she's the first private investigator in her world. And her and her partner in crime solving, Eld, uh, who's a suspiciously good swordsman, are determined to upend their corrupt society. So when they catch the case of their lives, they, they plan to leverage it for all it's worth. Um, and so they find themselves trying to discover the reason for uh, mysterious ships vanish vanishing in the far-flung reaches of the world. They have to solve a case, basically, that empires have failed to do so. Um, and along the way, mayhem ensues. Uh, there's mages and pirate queens and the undead, and then the gods get involved. And unfortunately for Buck, uh, the gods have plans. Uh, unfortunately for the gods, so does Buck. And so, so that's the pitch. It's kind of like uh, Pirates of the Caribbean meets um, Guy Ritchie, Sherlock Holmes, uh, if, if you're looking for some comps. So... So it's a lot of fun. I call it adventure fantasy with heart. Um, you know, Buck is a pretty harsh uh, heroine because she grew up on the streets, but there's a lot of heart there as well. Um, and yeah, I mean, the story, so the story is interesting. Uh, it actually came to me in a dream, which has never happened before. Um, you know, I've written 11 books so far. This is my eighth book. Uh, that was the first one that came to me in a dream. It is actually Buck's voice woke me up. Um, and character always comes to me first, so I normally hear voices in my head, which, you know, mm. can sometimes be a little disconcerting, mm -hmm. but uh, as an author, I think it's okay. And so normally I'll be on a walk and a, a character voice will come into my head and then I'll start to get more and more and that's how I, my stories develop. And then from there, I'm pretty, pretty regimented in how I put it together. But yeah, Buck just popped into my head, woke me up out of a dream and uh, half the book fell into my head right there. And I, I just sat down and like wrote it, wrote out the, the brief outline and um, never looked back. Yeah. That's amazing. Um, I will mention at this point that we have signed copies of all three of these titles. Um, Ryan's have already made it back to us, and then Jen and Andrea are sending theirs out tomorrow. So they are actually signed, not just book plates. They are available from Gibson's Bookstore. We are happy to do curbside pickup if you're local, and we do ship um, internationally as well. So uh, the next question I will ask the three of you, Andrea, I will start with you. Are you a pantser or a plotter when you start designing your book? Now, I'm getting the impression you might be a pantser if you said you tried to start a novella and then it 
got bigger? Um, well, you know, I think I go back and forth. So I had a plot for the novella that was very, I thought, oh, I've got a plot, you know, but I'd never done that before, but I thought if it's a novella, I better have a, you know, a tight plot. And I, I actually did the plot that I wrote, you know, so, you know, but I was like, but wait a minute, like, how does this happen? So what was actually the beginning of the book is now the middle of the book. And I had to write all the stuff that came before that. So I knew where I was going, but I couldn't get there as fast as I wanted to. Um, so I had to, and I also had to do a lot of world building. So I had people coming to me in dreams. This is the, the pantser part, I, you know, talking to me, just like, um, Ryan, you know, and they insisted, like, wait a minute, what's my backstory? Excuse me, girl, I have a lot to say to you. And um, where am I? Like, why do I think that? Why am I doing that? Like, in fact, who am I? You don't know who I am. So you think you know who I am and you put all that stuff over there, but how do I get there? And nobody will like me if they don't know. And I was like, oh, shut up. Because um, I'm trying to write a novella. So for like a year, I was trying to write a novella, but I wrote it all down because, you know, they were talking. I thought, okay, I respect you. I will write it down, but I'll just, I'll shove it into that plot that I wrote before, um, but it didn't shove in. So then I had to write 200 pages, really literally, to get to the, quote, beginning of the book, um, except for the first line. The first line is the same. Uh, <laughs> so, so I left the first, the first paragraph is the same, but in between the first paragraph and the second paragraph of the, of the plotted version is 200 pages. So um, it's just very funny to think of those things. Um, especially at night when you really do want to go to sleep and someone is telling you, you don't know what you're doing. I know what you're doing. Let me tell you. Um, so I do both. And Ryan, you, you, you said that characters just kind of speak to you in your dreams. So I'm getting the impression you might be a pantser as well. So yeah, it sounds that way, but I'm, I'm actually not. Uh, my characters are uh, are very organic. Um, they just kind of come to me. I don't really seek them out, and they, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll get a feeling of sense of who they are by by what I'm like hearing, uh, which again sounds weird, but um, that's just how it happens. But after that, I'm I'm very much a uh, an outliner and a plotter. Uh, I have a very regimented way for me. Like the outline is my first draft. Um, you know, somebody said that the first draft is the story you tell yourself and the second draft is the story you tell the reader. And so for me, my first prose draft is that draft is actually me telling the story to the reader because I've already told myself the story through a pretty complex outlining process. I use seven point story structure and uh, mm -hmm. the Hollywood formula for the emotional beats. And, um, and then I'll actually do a, a, a whole summary myself and, and write that out. And that's normally 25 to 30 pages. Um, so I know the story that I want to tell by the time I, I hit the prose part of it. But uh, I think at the end of the day, we're all pantsing at some point. It's just where do you choose to do that discovery work? Is it, you know, kind of up front or is it as you go? Um, but that's, that's kind of how I think about it. And Jen, how do you have a five book story? Do you plot or pants? Um, I do both. So I, I like to call what I am a milestoner um, because mm. it's, it's neither it's neither a fully outlined thing that I will studiously stick to, nor is it, um, you know, uh, changing as, well, it does change, but uh, it's not, um, I don't sit down with no idea of what I'm gonna do. I do sit down with an outline, but I sit down with um, a, a list of <laughs> milestone points that I want to reach along the way, um, and how I get to those milestones, that I may not know but I know where I need to be at each point. Um, and as long as I hit those milestones, I'm good. Um, and that allows me the flexibility to still have discovery, you know, so I can, I can still have those happy accidents that, uh, that I then want to develop and, and explore more without um, jeopardizing the overall story. So I'll be, oh, go ahead. Oh, no, I just wanted to say, sometimes I actually write a screenplay for my novel, and that looks as if that's a wonderful um, outline. <laughs> um, so I and I do it I, for um, my second novel, Redwood and Wildfire. I wrote a screenplay, and then I went from the screenplay to the novel, and so I could follow the Hollywood points and do all that stuff. 
but you know, I had to go from a screenplay to a novel. So there was so much discovery of, of the interior of the characters um, so that it was really fun. So I like that. So I mean, I'm, I, I, what I'm working on now, I also, I wrote a play for it and now I'm turning the play into a novel. So oh, that's interesting. So all three of you have mentioned your world building. So I'll pull my next question from there. Where do you each start with world building and what is the most fun part of creating a new world for you? All three of you have worlds that are not here. So how do you, how do you do that? And what's, what's the best part, Ryan, I'll start with you. Yeah, it's a great question. I mean, I think for me, I'm always interested in cultures that are kind of at a confluence point with other cultures. So, um, you know, quote unquote, melting pots, but not really necessarily melting into one another. Often there's friction there, but, um, you know, real world inspirations from the Mediterranean or, um, you know, uh, the Umayyad Empire uh, in southern Spain and, and North Africa, uh, the Caribbean. Those are those are the types of places that I always find really interesting and we don't necessarily see a lot of in fantasy, although that's definitely changed in the last few years, which I think is good. Um, so those are the types of things that get me interested. Um, but again, going back to character, it, the, it's kind of what is the impression I'm getting that this person's world is like? And then thinking about what do I want to build around that? What's going to cause the most tension? What's going to be the most... I don't want to say painful experience for them because I don't get uh, joy out of torturing characters like I know some authors do. I actually feel awful, but um, but what is what is really going to hit home there? And then I just start layering it on. You know, I think the iceberg is that analogy that gets thrown out a lot. Um, what's above the water that we can see on the page, and then what's below. But I don't go too far below. What I like to do is use on the page descriptions to let the reader know that there's something deeper out there. So it could be, you know, a character talking about the next quarter over and the way they describe that place tells you a lot about it, whether it's, you know, um, been recently gentrified or whether it's kind of where the old money lives and, and those sorts of things. And I think if you can sprinkle those details throughout, does a lot of the world building for you without having to sit down and necessarily map out, you know, 20 family trees. Mm. Um, and uh, Jen, how, uh, how, what's your favorite part about world building? Where do you start with that? Don't make me choose. <laughs> Don't make me choose. Um, I, I really enjoy the world building process. So I, I don't have a single favorite part. You know, I mean, I, I typically start, um, at least for this universe, I, I started with map. Um, and then, you know, worked out, uh, yeah, I started like with the core seed, right? It started with the map, work out the climate, work out where the different crops grow. I mean, I started really, really um, at, the, at the basic level. Um, but, you know, I mean, I love developing the cultures and, and uh, figuring out um, all of the different, uh, you know, specialties and and regions and economics and you know all of that sort of stuff is just fun to me um so i i know a lot of authors think of that as work and i think of that as the treat <laughs> um, that i get to do um either before i start or along the way um and usually as i'm developing that um the conflicts kind of just naturally follow because you know, there's, there's never one land that has everything they need or want. Um, so, you know, trade happens and then conflict happens and, and wars happen and they all just sort of um, very naturally, uh, organically evolve. Um, and, you know, at that point, you, you start ending up with what becomes a story. Mm. And... I, were you the person in school, Jen, who was drawing the maps of castles and towns, or was that? Oh, abs oh, oh absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. That was me. <laughs> um, Andrea, how about you? With uh, Master of Poisons and with world building in general, what is your favorite part, and where do you start? I, I start with the spirit world, with cosmology. I, I start with what do people believe? What do... You know, and then I go to the art, to the theater, because, you know, that's where I'm from. <laughs> so I go, like, what kind of stories do they tell? How do they tell them? You know, um, so, and then all that comes, you know, sort of in a performance way for me. So the characters 
let me know what their cosmology is. So then I figure out, oh, okay, you're from that kind of place. And so I go with um, the languages they speak and what they, you know, every language is a world, you know, it builds a world. So what, what do you focus on in your language and what can you say in that other language and what can't you say in your language? Um, and what do you, you know, what are your um, deep held values and beliefs and how do you relate yourself to the cosmos and what is the, the, the nature land relationship to the cosmos and you and how all those things fit together. Um, so that's what I do a lot. And then I say, Andrea, you need to draw a map. And so, you know, because I'm, I'm like deep in the spirit world, but like, let's put some feet on the ground. So I draw this terrible like map thing that, you know, it's actually like what I would do as a director for a play. I just make like little stick figures and, and say, here's north, south, east, and west. And the, and the blocking goes like this. Um, and so I did that so that I, you know, and then people would say, but we don't know where we are yet. Who are reading drafts. And I'm like, all oh, right, we really got to get, get the feet on the ground. So then I really focus on the map. You know, there's a big period of, in the middle of writing where I'm like, okay, you really know how they use language and what their gods are and how they talk to one another, but what is down the road? And, you know, what are the plants? I mean, you know, what are the crops? because um, I get the plants too, because they're part of the cosmology. Um, and then finally, you know, I pull back from the map and I go, does the map go with the cosmology? <laughs> and then I have to revise, right? I have to go back and forth. So, um, and it's always character centered. It, it, you know, they're telling me, no, it's not like this. And, um, and so in, in fact, in this book, I put in the notion of storyteller as map maker, um, because every map is a story. Um, and that happened to me as I was writing. And so I went, oh, and my character's a storyteller. So she has to do that too. So that was a, um, a way of, you know, really understanding what the process of, of creating a world is. It's making this map. Okay, so I will um, tell our audience that if you do have questions, we will be answering them at towards the end of the event. So if you want to start thinking about them, start typing them in. I am starting to see a couple. I do have some more questions for our authors, though, and I'll start with Jen. Jen, you switched main characters between books. Um, how does that change how you write, and what does that open up for you as a writer and as a plotter? I didn't switch main characters. I, I always had, um, from the very, very beginning, there were going to be, um, there were going to be four main characters and there have been four main characters. Um, you know, what I did quite a bit was change. Um, so, so the books are, um, the books are diegetic, um, which means that the, the books exist in the world of the books. They're written by characters in the world. So, um, you know, one of the characters in the books is the person who pulled together all of the stories for book one. Uh, so a different character pulls together all of the stories for book two. Uh, and she has a different emphasis on what she thinks is important um, than, than the man who pulled everything together for book one. Um, notes, the footnotes are hilarious like I love the footnotes in the book and especially when you start to piece together who that yes is. it's hilarious well because you know I, when I finished writing the first book um, I I realized that given the nature of the the, the gentleman who's pulling the book together um, he's, he's a very um, scholarly sort um, uh, he's definitely an academic I realized there was just no way that he was not going to footnote things <laughs> Because <laughs> he has to, he had to put in, you know, a couple of times where there was just like, you know, especially because there's a lot of unreliable narration uh, in the book. There, there's just moments where he had to be like, no, <laughs> that's not right. <laughs> this person has said a thing, but that's not true. Um, so, you know, so book three goes back to him. Book three, mm -hmm. he's, he pulls book three back together again and footnotes book three again. So, um but it, it was what the books needed. I mean, I guess in terms of the main characters and, and who has, uh, has those larger roles. Um, you know, book one was largely about Kieran and book two, although 
Kieran is there. I mean, you're not wrong. It, it does mostly center on a different character. Um, but that was what book two needed. So, um, you know, there was never, there was never any doubt in my mind that that was how I needed to handle it. Thank you. So, <laughs> um, Andrea, uh, how differently does an older protagonist approach a quest than a younger protagonist? And how differently are those written and plotted? Whoa, right. So I have an older character who gets older and they both get older. So that's the same. Um, but one, you know, thinks I know everything and the one, the other one thinks I'm trying to learn everything. Um, so they have really different um, intentions um, and that, you know, obviously different experiences. Um, and uh, so it was actually fun to have, you know, somebody in their 40s and someone who goes from 12 to like 20. Um, and, you know, people were telling me, oh, but people will confuse it and think it's YA or, you know, and I'm, I'm, yeah, right, whatever. Um, so I'm an older person. Um, and I, I didn't have YA when I was growing up, right? We just had books. And if you liked it, you liked it. And if you read it, you read it. So I read whatever I wanted, you know, and my mother would go, oh, you're reading that. Um, and then what, what do you think of it? And I would tell her and she would laugh sometimes. And later I would realize that this was some quote adult book, but she thought that what I said was like right on and it, it was the story I was getting. And so that to me is what I wanted to do with the two um, protagonists, that the things that each of them, you know, is, is curious about, focused on, passionate about is very different because of where they are, but they're in the same world and they also share a lot um, so that they're able to, you know, connect about this world and about their quest. So eventually they, you know, meet um, and, you know, and, and they find themselves in each other. So that was also fun. Um, and age, and they're not, you know, um, it's not a romance. It's none of those things, but it is kindred spirits. And I, I really enjoyed having kindred spirits from different age groups. It can be difficult to find adventure and fantasy novels that do have protagonists that aren't just in their 20s as well. I just read a book and I loved it because the protagonist complained about his knees. The whole <laughs> book and he's like, oh, I would have made this jump when I was 15 years ago. And I'm like this, I relate to this. Like when I get down and I try and get back up, I mean, I, I love right fantasy novels with all ages of protagonists, but it's like, I see myself right here where he's like, this doesn't fit like it used to, you know, and I love, I love yeah. the protagonists now. Ryan, I'm going to switch to you. Talk to me a bit about imbalances of power and how people struggle to change or keep those imbalances like haves and have nots, and gangs and pirates. And... Yeah, no, that's a great question. I mean, a lot of a lot of what's going on behind the scenes in the sin and the steel, and a lot of what's driving our our heroine is that imbalance of power. Um, you know, she is a street rat. She doesn't have anything. All she has is uh, you know a very sharp intellect and um, you know a desire to read. Uh, somebody, uh, one of one of the reviewers, compared her to Alexander Hamilton, which I hadn't thought about before, but I think mm. is actually pretty true. Um, you know, kind of came from nothing, an immigrant. Uh, she's not an immigrant, but she's coming from nothing and has to use her wits to survive. And so, you know, the book does explore a, a variety of those different power imbalances. And she's always striving to put herself on top, because if you're not on top on the streets, you're, you know, you're going to end up dead in the gutter. So, you know, we see her, you know, facing off against trading companies, pirates, uh, mages, all these different power imbalances. And it's interesting because, you know, she is, um, I think she has that arrogance of youth. She's incredibly intelligent, but she's not always wise. And so she very rarely sees herself as being the one who's imbalanced, even though it's very clear that from a societal perspective, you know, she's a young woman who, who grew up with nothing, that, that she is put in that place and, you know, the uh, the book begins not really spoiler the book begins with them on on trial after a case went badly and there's there's blackmail involved and the interesting thing is and I think this is the tone throughout the whole book is watching her kind of turn the tables on them and so at the end you're kind of left wondering well was she blackmailed or did she actually kind of flip it and blackmail them and they didn't even realize it. Uh, at this point, I will remind folks again that we do have signed copies of the books available and we are happy to ship. 
Uh, we have a question from Janine who says she hasn't really read any fantasy and she's not certain where to start the journey. Typically, she reads nonfiction and historical fiction. So can each of you perhaps suggest as a starting point for Janine a fantasy novel that you think beginning fantasy readers should pick up? Oh. Yeah, I have, um, I, I saw that question, I was thinking about it. Uh, I, I have two suggestions. One is um, an author named Mary Robinette Kowal. Uh, her first mm -hmm. um, series of books was basically Jane Austen's Pride and Prejudice, but with magic. And uh, I think it's called The Glamorous Histories. Um, but if you search her name, you'll find that. She also wrote a World War I um, kind of paranormal fantasy book. Mm -hmm. So these are books that are, are very much in our world, but have a little bit of fantasy if you're trying to ease in. And then the other one I would suggest is the complete opposite. It's more of a deep dive, but it's a very fun, quick, interesting read um, by Br Brandon Sanderson, who's one of the giants in the fantasy genre. Um, and his first trilogy, the first book is called Mistborn. It's kind of like Ocean's Eleven, but with really cool um, metal-based magic. So if you want to try, you know, taking a deep dive into fantasy, that would be my rec. Mm. Do the two of you want to think on that, or we could? No, no, no. Or... I've got a couple. I actually want to on the Brandon Sanderson one. I would, although Mistborn is a great recommendation, I would actually personally say El Elantris, since that's one book rather than a, a trilogy. So if you're if you're looking for just to dip your toe in, that might be an easier Brandon Sanderson book to uh, to do it with. Um, but for other things that are just sort of like alternate universe fantasy um like i want to say I, I keep thinking of um uh uh black god's drums um mm -hmm. by uh p jelly clark um that was that was a that sort of takes place in a america that never was kind of deal it's it's a little steampunk but it, it's really really good um too so mm -hmm. Yeah, um, yeah, it's not it's not very big, um, so it's it's a quick read, um, and um, I mean, fortunately, certainly there's a lot of historical esque fantasies that I'll probably hit the right history um, note with you, um, but a lot of it is going to depend on your own preferences for this sort of thing. So it's it's hard to give a recommendation since it's such a big field. Um, well, I'll, I'll recommend Everfair by Nisi Shaw. Yeah, which that's is a good one. Yeah. Steampunk historical. Um, and I'll even go back to like older, like read um, Octavia Butler's Kindred, um, which is also, which was actually originally published as historical fiction. Um, so did, she, yeah, yeah. yeah. All right. So that's, yeah. um, those are really, really, really interesting. And I like, um, uh, again, um, if you want like, okay, I'm going to start on huge, big books and read forever, like how many, how many words in yours, Jen? Like a million words? Um, for the whole series, yeah. For the whole series. And those are great because you just become, you live in them. So, you know, I love um, anything by Tad Williams. I really enjoy just plunging in and the, the prose is really delightful. And so any, anything of his, you know, um, would be fun. So, um, yeah. Uh, and, you know, and I wrote, wait, I, I, I wrote a historical fantasy, that's right, Redwood and Wildfire. <laughs> I, I'm just realizing that's like 19th century, turn of the, you know, 20th century. So that, too. Um, so, and, and a lot of people, you know, couldn't decide whether it was historical romance, fantasy, you know, magical realism. So, you know, it's sort of on the cusp of things. Do you all have anything that you wrote that you could recommend? Well, I mean, you know, you. This is this is my first series, so. Oh, okay. Um, okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and I'm a debut, but um, <laughs> if you like Pirates of the Caribbean, meet Sherlock Holmes. You know, I think. Oh yeah, like yeah, yeah. Okay. Janine says thank you. Um, so I, my next question is specifically for Andrea and Jen, but Ryan, feel free to pipe in, and it does call back to a comment you made, Jen, about um fantasy written by female authors often gets classified as young adults. Do you have any things you want to say about this, about that you might? I hate it. <laughs> you know, you know. <laughs> um, you know, yeah, I, I hate it. Um, I, I think it was, it was Andrea's comment about that, but yeah, um, 
it was, uh, I mean, I, I've seen it, I have not seen it as much now, certainly when I was a debut, um, I, I would see it a lot where mm -hmm. people would, would comment about my book and just sort of automatically classify it as YA. Um, because in the first book, the, um, the main, main character, uh, you know, goes from being a, uh, a teenager to not being a teenager. Um, and then is going to not be a teenager for the rest of the series. Um, but you know, it's just such a weird default. Um, you know, I too kind of grew up in a time where that was not really a thing. You just, you, you had a, fantasy and science fiction san section and that's where you went <laughs> and, yeah, yeah. um so it it didn't even occur to me that people would do that you know would assume that my books are um are ya um i i'm a little mystified by it to be honest yeah for my third book which has some young characters in it um my agent said that you know people like the book but they were worried that it had too much of a ya feel but was also an adult book. And so how would they categorize it? Um, so, but I just decided I would persist in writing what I wanted to write, which is that I like to include people of all ages or, you know, like a diversity of perspective. So age is one of them. Uh, and uh, again, Master of Voices, they didn't say anything about that. They were like, fine. Yeah. So that was like, just like what you said, Jen, I think maybe things have changed. Um, so I'm hoping they change. Oh, no. <laughs> I don't know. I, I don't well, think so. I still, I still see it with, um, I still see it with debut um, authors who are women. I, okay. I still see it. I still see that automatic default assumption that, that you're yeah. writing. Well, it's YA. patronizing. It's very patronizing. The assumption is, I, you know, and I, I invite, you know, young adult people to read my book. I'm, sure. you know, so that's not what I'm saying. I'm not saying I'm not writing for them, but I'm not doing the thing where I'm writing to this niche audience um, that, you know, looks like one of the characters in the book, right? I'm, I'm writing a story that I want people to read and relate to um, and from wherever they come, from wherever they stand. And I'm hoping that they'll just stick with it and find what they, you know, can get out of the story. So that to me, is why I write, not because I'm not trying to like go, okay, I'm writing for that teeny weeny group. Um, and that's a marketing tool. Um, so it might be a big group, but I'm, I'm trying to write a story that is actually multifaceted. So uh, Brent asks, when writing a series, what are your strategies for making each book satisfying on its own while still setting up future books? Is well, yeah. <laughs> Go ahead. Um, so, so with the caveat that um, that book three kind of ends on a cliffhanger, I there's certain kinds of cliffhangers I really don't like in books. Um, specifically, I personally have a real problem with the cliffhanger of um, the story is literally cut in half. Oh. Um, I I like um, each book to have an arc a full arc that begins and you know finishes and, and has a climax and ends um and i feel that that's very important um especially because you know it, it it's going to be a little while before you read the next book so um i just think that that looking at each book as acknowledging that it needs to be its own book mm -hmm. is is important um you know, and then if you want to have, you know, uh, a, a little thing at the, in the epilogue or whatever that suggests what's going to happen, a teaser yeah. for the next book, um, fine, that's great. You know, we love that. But, um, but that's not the kind of cliffhanger I'm, I'm trying to avoid. So I, it just each book is its own book, I guess, is my big thing. Ryan, did you want to add to that? Sure. Um... And, and quick shout out to, to Brent. Uh, so um, he is uh, part of the Blockbuster team for uh, Fire Lip Mag. So if you're looking for um, some amazing uh, fiction by, by uh, Black Voices, check that out. And he's actually doing a collab with Tor.com, I believe, 
and open to submissions, I think, although check the internet because I could be wrong. So shout out to Brent. He's a really, really great guy. Um, yeah, so I mean, I think, I think Jen said a lot of good things there and that's, that's kind of how I approach it too, is just thinking about what is a self-contained story that I'm trying to tell uh, in and of itself? Um, and what's the question that I'm posing in that, you know, hopefully that first page, but that first chapter, that, that first opening that I'm trying to answer by the end, I really want to make sure that the reader feels like there was a very satisfying arc and conclusion at the end of that. Certainly there can be larger objectives though. And ideally, I think that's what you're looking for. Like what are those small milestones that aren't really small? They're big and there's fireworks and it's exciting. But what are those even larger ones that there's, you know, nobody thinks that there's, is this going to be solved in one book? And, you know, whether you introduce that at the beginning or the two thirds mark or even in the epilogue, um, I think that's all fine. The only thing I would caution is when you are writing a series, make sure that you're leaving hints along the way. So the reader doesn't get to the end and think, wow, that's it. And then it's like, wait, there's more? How could there be more? Um, so it's, it's definitely tricky, but I, I think those are some tips. So uh, I have another question here, which I think I will address to Andrea because she mentioned this, that she had lots of things, backstory uh, for her characters and for the story. Was there anything that didn't make it into the final edit that you wish you could have kept? No, because my problem was the 40,000 words to get it to be bigger. So uh, I got to put in everything. Uh, that was, you know, I had to keep, like, keep pulling, like, come on, get the rest of this out. So, because, um, right, while I was writing, I was doing lots of research and I would go, oh my God, you know, I want to write about uh, crows. And then they would end up being a character. So I have uh, animal characters who have point of view chapters. Um, and then I was like, oh my God, crows are amazing. How can I get that in? And I got it in because it solved a, like a plot problem. <laughs> so I, I had like wonderful um, uh, moments of like, oh my God, how can I like, I need a point of view that's big. So I use the trees. Um, you know, and I had done all the research and trees are amazing. They communicate with your roots and chemicals and all this stuff. And they live a long, long time. They have a deep view and they're like, you know, they understand the dirt. I mean, they're great. So when I had to tell a big part of the story that no one else could have seen, the trees were uh, coming to my rescue. So I felt like I got um, to put in like, you know, oh, this is a neat thing. I'm going to use that to solve a problem. <laughs> of the backstory of how this works. Um, so I got to use all of them. Jen? Wanna, I, I got, yeah, I got one. So, so I mean, the problem with my, the, my series is it's, you know, it's the cast of thousands, right? You know, it's, it's a huge, um, there's all these different characters that are off doing things. And uh, unfortunately, uh, sometimes they're doing really interesting things that have nothing to do with the main story. Um, so there, there definitely were some times where I, you know, would catch myself writing a couple of chapters about what was going on with certain characters and then go, oh, that's not important. Um, so, uh, so those, those kind of just got tucked away. I don't throw anything away, but, you know, so who knows? Uh, they, they may come out for a different story. I, I, I don't write short stories either. I, I, I'm just terrible at it. Um, my, my joke is that, you know, my, my husband teases me that I've never written a short story that wasn't chapter one. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, that, that's, that's where that's going. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I, um, so I was tricky. I, I did have to cut some things and then I snuck them back in in different ways. Uh, so one, one, so I changed the, the final act in my book. Um, I tend to be an underwriter, so I actually had to add more, but there was a, a key point that I had to take out. So, um, I can't for spoiler reasons talk about that, but it does make a reappearance later. And then my character, she, 
so I mentioned she's a, you know, um, a kind of autodidact. So throughout the book, she references books in world that she's read that give her specific knowledge to get out of a situation or flip the tables on folks. And then at the very end, there's this like annotated library that gives a little bit more detail about the book she references. And one of the titles of those books is the original title of, of my book, because um, typically, unless you're really lucky, whatever you come up with and, and you pitch to your editor does not actually make it. Um, and I don't think mine even made it past my agent, but, but I, I slipped it in there in the back and nobody noticed. And so I got it out. Can you share that with us or was that a spoiler? Uh, no, it's, uh, it's Black Flag Shadow. Oh. Sometimes I feel like the extra bits need to be um, pre-order incentives. I feel like if you could write a couple extra scenes that never made it in, I feel like people would like that as the incentives. But... Well, the thing that I do do is like in, in a book that I wrote, Will Do Magic for Small Change, that's the title. Actually, my titles tell me what the book is about, so usually they don't change. So that was, that's the title of that book, but it had 20,000 words too many. So I, ne I didn't take out any action, any character, any event. I just had to go through and edit every moment because it had 20,000. My, my editor said, you cut 20,000 words, and actually she meant cut a whole lot. But I took her literally, so I went, oh, God, i got to cut 20,000 words. Oh, my God, that's going to be hard. So I did it. Um, oh, it was more like 19,800 or something. And then I sent it back to her, and she said, I, wow, okay, great. Um, but so it, it was more, you know, that I just, do I need all of these words to say this? Because sometimes I need a whole lot of words to figure out what I'm saying. And then I needed those words, but does the reader need all of those words? So that's more what I tend to cut out, like, and we don't need to know every single aspect of this really incredible action that you've written. Um, just get rid of what's not necessary. So, um, and now that I can cut 20,000 words from a 120,000 word novel, I feel like, wow. So I did that on Master of Poisons as well. Not quite as many, but I did one of those edits where I asked myself, you know, what on this page can go? Bethany asks, in what ways does the depth of your world building influence other types of art and creativity you create or seek out in your life? I, I, want, the, I want the theater person to answer that one. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, well, I, I feel, I, I really feel that I rely on my theater. So I rely on, um, uh, like, polyrhythm, that's something that's in my book. So I, I'm a musician, so I play uh, balafon, which is a West African instrument. And I uh, know uh, griots who tell stories with amazing, like, you know, oh my God, Tama drums, which I put in my book. So all the things that I do in the theater end up in the book. So when I have a moment that's on stage, I just pretend like I'm a director and a playwright, and then I do it and I draw from all the research that I've been doing for like, I don't know, my whole life. Um, so that then I can really make it a real moment, like, would this work on stage? And that's actually the question. And I've done a lot of world building on stage, literally, like we make the masks, we build the sets, we act the show. So I've actually created different worlds, different times, different places. And so I use that, and that's what I like. So when I'm writing a novel, I go from the theater world, I, I love festival drama. Um, so I have festival drama in Master of Poisons. I have mass, I have music, I have storytellers, and they tell a great myth. Um, and this is based on all the theater that I've done for years and years, and particularly West African theater or Caribbean theater or even um, indigenous American theater, where um, it's not necessarily a, you know, a narrative action, but you know, a monumental moment in the, in the cosmology of the people that is represented by the entire town, right, or the village. And you all come together and you make meaning with each other. So that's like a, yeah, I love that. And then I try to make my book do that. So that's the kind of world building I want to do that, you know, the, the reader can have a, a sense of that. Do uh, Ryan or Jen, can either of you think of anything in particular that world building influences in your life? Um, so kind of basically everything. <laughs> I mean, you know, uh, I, I very much, I very much relate to what you just said. Um, you know, everything that I am interested in, 
everything that I do as an artist, um, all of my hobbies, um, all of those things sooner or later uh, will show up and, and will make themselves known in the books in some fashion. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, you know, I think, I think particularly when you're doing something that is this grand and, and big that you just, you're going to put all of yourself into it. Um, sometimes whether you realize you are or not. Right. Um, <laughs> so you look back and go, oh, well, mm. <laughs> okay, yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that wasn't personal at all. Uh, um, but uh, you know, I have a, I have an awful lot of um, awful lot of things that I like to do uh, on the creative stage. Um, in in some cases, having come from a little bit of a theater background myself, also <laughs> on the stage. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I, I think that that just all helps. It all makes it mm -hmm. prettier. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I don't know if I have anything creative or, or artsy about my that my world building influences, but I mean, definitely my world building influences uh, the the history that I read. I'm a huge history buff, but it'll get me reading things that I might not otherwise read. Um, mm -hmm. I'm huge into travel, uh, so I've been you know all over the world from Southeast Asia to the Middle East, uh, Europe, the Caribbean. And uh, I was planning to go to Uganda this this summer until you know the pandemic happened, and so so all of that just pushes me to to want to seek out new experiences, and so I think that's probably you know a way that it influences me. Next year in Uganda, right? You will get there. We're getting there. It's just a question of when. As soon as that vaccine is here. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. Across. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Cherie asks, without spoiling the novels as best you can, which scene, chapter, or character was your favorite to write and why? Oh gosh, um, you know, I had a huge amount of fun writing book three, so it would be very difficult for me to point to any specific part of it and go, this was my favorite, because I would keep updating and go, no, 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 this is my favorite. Uh, this was my favorite. But, um, but there was a bit of world building that I did um, for uh, the, the religion side of things, one of the, the god kings that is worshipped in on one of the other continents that they travel to um, is this fellow called the, the Lord of Little Houses. And I'm not going to explain what he does or what that is or anything else like that. Just know that I am a 12-year-old. And, <laughs> and I giggled the entire time I was writing that. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> uh, okay. Not going to explain anything more about that. <laughs> Just know it's something that a 12 year old would come up with. <laughs> Andrea, Ryan, do you have a favorite? Um, well, I have many favorites just like Jen, but I think I could say all of the, I have like 10 chapters that are from non human characters. And it was really a lot of fun to write all of these non human characters and to try to, you know, get into inside of them. So this for me was a theater event. So what I would do to write them was, you know, a theater exercise. So I had to become them and then use my senses and thoughts and emotions from their perspective. So that was a lot, a lot of fun. And the other scenes were when I'm like writing a theater moment, right? So, um, and, and that's a real challenge because I'm, you know, it's not gonna be on stage. So how do I really get to, to have people enjoy this as they would if they were sitting with a whole bunch of other people and there was and there was simultaneous stuff you know in in the performance you have you can see it you can smell it you can hear the other people your hearts you're all beating together um you, the music is happening and a character is talking and they like jump at you and you're like oh, you know i mean all of that how can i get that with a very the linear process of one word after another so that was that was a challenge that i appreciated and so i enjoyed trying to, you know, make that work along with trying to like get inside a B and be a B character. I mean, I think for me, Sam Bukinia, my my main character is, is the the my my most favorite for sure. I, I love spending time with her on the page. Um, it's always challenging because she's far more intelligent than I am. So I really have to think through 
You know, if I had all the time in the world to figure this out and I was really smart, what would it look like? Because she's even smarter. Um, but the only other thing I'll say is, uh, and uh, there's a cover, there's a quote on the back um, up from one of the blurbs from Max Gladstone. So it's not spoiling anything, but the scene with the feral hogs was a lot of fun to write. I can just imagine. Yeah. Thing sentence just right there. Um, yep. So. <laughs> gonna take us out with some rapid fire questions for each of you some just fun um but i will mention one last time that these books are available signed from gibson's bookstore the sin and the steel master of poisons and memory of souls uh, feral hogs were there 30 to <laughs> <laughs> that's literally the uh the quote <laughs> on the back <laughs> Nice. So, all right. So, let me start here. Um, okay, Andrea, salty or sweet snacks? Salty. Salty. Ryan, last book you bought for the cover? Uh, Elia Don Johnson's Trouble the Saints. Jen, do you use the Oxford comma? Yes. Okay, um, okay. Andrea, what is, uh, do you prefer summer or winter? Summer. Ryan, what is your ideal sandwich? Uh, well, it's BLT season, so I'm going with that. Okay, and Jen, what is your zombie apocalypse skill? Uh, dead. <laughs> <laughs> Not what I expected. <laughs> I, I don't have much faith in my ability to survive in a zombie apocalypse. <laughs> before the event you crochet so you can make nets and you will keep people from freezing to death in the winter my my post-apocalyptic skills are many many um from from sewing to crochet to paper making to um all all sorts of stuff yeah cooking and yeah <laughs> if if zombies are not part of the equation if just surviving is part of the equation i'm good <laughs> all right caveat for the question three of you very much for joining me this evening. This was a lot of fun. I appreciate your time. Uh, one last time, thank you everybody joining us from home and thank you to Ryan Van Loan, Andrea Harrison, and Jen Lyons. Have a great night, everybody. Thank you. Thank you yeah. for having us. Thank you. Yeah.